This is what a basic command center would look like on the, on the, on the, uh, the shoreline. You've got, this is the console that runs the communications and the, uh, and the surface supply, air supply. You have a cascading system of air tanks. You have to have a bunch of them extras, depending upon if you're a big guy, little guy, you breathe harder, breathe faster. And you have 500 feet of umbilical, which I showed you earlier that had the, the three umbilicals in it. You have 500 feet of that. And you've got uh, search lines that, that you have um, uh, connected to the diver for the uh, last, last ditch effort to drag them up. But this has 5,000 pound tensile strength, so you can, you can drag a lot along the bottom if you have to with that. You have an operator sitting here that communicates and you have either a dive master or the team leader that oversees the operations. And you'll have a line handler on each diver that's down. So you can operate two, from this system here, you can operate two divers at the same time. But that goes through air quickly. So normally we would just run one diver at a time. And depending upon how long they'd stay, we'd have anywhere between 20 and 40 bottles uh, of air laying on the side just to make sure we had enough. You know, it's a pretty nice little setup, but it really gets old, the guy sitting here. I mean, the same thing as the guy taking notes uh, and documenting, it gets old. But this guy knows that he better sit here and pay attention because he's the next one on the line. And the guy that he forgot to turn the air on to the next canister and he was yelling, where's my air? He's going to be watching the monitor for him. So th there is some, you know, uh, acuity and functionality that goes into this because of self-preservation. Three basic safety rules. The team, at the direction of the team leader, and in cons consultation with the investigative personnel, will determine, will determine when to dive. The team alone will determine when not to dive. So if the team decides that this is not a good place to dive, this is a very, very bad area, there's a lot of problems, you know, they can call in no joy. Done. Will not, will not happen. One of the times that we, the closest I ever came to losing a diver was years and years and years ago when, when we didn't have surface supplied, you know, we had a line that we used hand signals, okay? A string was tied to this diver who had one tank on his back and he would go in and look and we, one pull, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Two pulls, you're low on air. Two pulls, I'm low on air because you can't see these gauges. You can't, you know, you can't see your time, your watch. Three pulls, you're in trouble. Well, most of the time you never got the three pulls back because if he was in trouble, you know, the line was maybe wrapped around a tree, the line, and it was just by the grace of God, you know, that the technology we had at the time that nobody ever got hurt. But we were doing a job in the Delaware River down by Pennsylvania, down by Philly, and we had a, a diver go in, and luckily this guy was a former Special Forces guy, so he was, you know, um, a pretty squared away guy and, and physically fit and didn't really, you know, wasn't prone to panic a lot. Well, he was swimming along, pitch black, looking for something in the Delaware River, and he swam up uh, a vent pipe for one of the factories that was producing whatever down there. And he got up the vent pipe and got stuck. So he got stuck somehow, either it got wrapped around something, that someone had cages, the cages might have ripped, he couldn't see any of this. He didn't know where he was, he didn't know what he was in, but he was able to undo himself and get out. And we had no knowledge of this because this is before we had communications, this is before we had you know, um, air, surface supplied air. He was able to undo himself, get back out the hole, and come back up and goes, uh, we're not diving anymore today. And he explained what happened, and I said, good call. <laughs> this is your typical site, okay? Un, 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 you know, not to mention the lovely tropical waters that you saw the video in. This is your typical site. This is a cow pond in Mississippi, okay? And I'm not really a farmer, but I kind of know what was in this cow pond. <laughs> and, you know, it's really, really kind of disgusting. So this is basically the, 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 the typical, typical scene. This was a clear day. We had two divers in the water. And you can see there's a fence line, if you can't, but there's a fence that goes around, little wooden posts with the barbed wire, typical cow fence. And out of, out, of, out of the blue, a lightning bolt, clear, clear sky lightning came down, hit the fence post. Well, it traveled through the fence post into the muddy ground and shot into the muddy pond and hit both divers, okay? Uh, one diver in the shoulder and one in the back of the leg. And luckily, both of them were fine. And they said that basically it felt like somebody took a hammer and hit them on those two spots where the, where the uh, electricity hit them. But th these are the kind of things that, you know, you can't predict, but when it happens, you have to be ready to, to take care of the issue. This was the, one of the divers that came out of this cow pond, okay? This is the kind of slop and the kind of, in the ears. Of, this is a great female age, love the girl to death. But this is the kind of stuff she did for us. She'd go in and then just go for it. 
You know, so you're talking polluted water diving, all sorts of hazards. I was diving in, down in Miami, I was doing a hull search of one of these big uh, container ships. And I'm swimming along, merrily we go. You understand, with these container ships, it's not like, you know, they don't have points, they're kind of flat. So you really got to kind of watch what you're doing under there so you don't get lost and start swimming in circles. Um, so I'm going along and I'm feeling whatever we're looking for. I think we're looking for limpet mines. Somebody thought there was a limpet mine on the bottom of the ship. But all of a sudden I go, ow, oh, I just shake my finger and I look and a little nick in my glove. So I keep on going and finish the job. We didn't find anything. I come up and uh, so the medic gives me a little shot, you know, a little antibiotic shot and off we go. Well, about two days later, my finger looks like uh, it's got leprosy. It's black, it's ugly, it's swollen. So I go, I guess go to the doctor. So I go to the doctor. Next thing I know, I'm in the, with the Center for Disease Control. I have atypical tuberculosis in my finger from the anti-fouling paint on the bottom of these ships and whatever God only knows was growing on this thing. I ended up getting tuberculosis in my finger, which I never thought would happen. Mostly I think tuberculosis, lungs, coughing, wheezing, but I ended up getting it in my finger. So from then on, we went to Kevlar gloves. So it, it, it's always a progression. It's always something that you have to you know, better, better service the divers with and understand. But normally, if the progression happens because something bad happened. But, you know, you try and eliminate most of the bad. Okay, um, different types of search patterns. That, that, that's the critical thing with this stuff. You have to be just so particular because you can't see. Okay, you're there with a magnetometer and you're going back and forth across the line and you hear a little buzz in your head. It's like, Ooh. That's all you're hearing for like hours. That's enough to put anybody in the insane asylum. But so when, when you hear the high pitch, you know there's something there. So then you have to start groping around in the mud, just, and you're trying to visualize. Now, what am I looking for? A gun? No, that's rebar. Okay. What am I looking for? A knife? No, that's a part of a shopping cart. And you know, so you're constantly maneuvering, and and these patterns. You can only do these patterns for so long. Now the circular pattern. That's if you have a spot that's out in the middle of a lake, you know that the guy fell overboard or went out there with his wife and dropped the jewelry or her into the middle of the lake. So you can start in the middle of the lake and do a circular pattern. That, that, that works well in those types of instances. The arc pattern, you can do that from the shoreline and, and that's pretty much a, a nice thing. You have you know, one of the line handlers and he's the, the point, the fulcrum of the arc and you have the guy in a rope and it's basically like you're fishing. You let him come back and you pull him a little bit then you let him go back the other way. And you can do that if you know it's not that far out. But these are not very uh, accurate pattern searches to do. They're not really, um, you know, you, you don't cover the same spot. You don't have overlap, which is critical when you're doing this stuff. So basically, the, um, the shore-based parallel or perpendicular searches are pretty much the best to do. But they take forever. You know, they take a long time because you're overlapping. The, the snag search. <clears throat> unless you're off Fort Lauderdale on the beach, you throw a line in and try and pull something in, you're going to snag something. You're going to snag a lot of things, not necessarily what you're looking for. So that really doesn't work, but in very specific conditions. But the perpendicular or the parallel search is where you run lines out on buoys, and they're, they're weighted down with cinder block, and you just start following out the line, doing the search. When you get to the end, you move the one block a couple of feet, you come back, you move it, you go back and forth, and back and forth. That is the best, and, and by, by far, the most accurate search to do when you're looking for small items. We're looking for guns, we're looking for bullets, we're looking for small knives, you're looking for, you know, we're not looking for a car, we're, not, we're looking for very small evidentiary material. Uh, bank bags with money in them, um, you know, think of anything that might be used that, that's it's pretty small in a crime and somebody throws someplace. You know, that, you need to be very meticulous in the search patterns.